I've got a survey here that I actually received when I was giving, in the week, one year ago, okay? It was a G20 summit that was happening in, uh, in London. And uh, this was the cover note for the survey. And uh, we're invited to, to answer this question here about translation uh, in relation to the G20 summit. You know what that's about because you're translating and interpreting that sort of stuff all day. Okay? <coughs> a pretty sort of neutral cover note. But let's look at the, so if we can find it, the actual survey. Good. How important do you consider the role of language and translation to be in relation to the following? Improved education, improved health, improved justice, improved, improved. How are you supposed to answer, since they've sent it to you as a linguist or a translation scholar or a translator or somebody involved with language? Uh, improved, improved, improved. Very important, very important, very important, obviously. Notice there are only improved things there. We can't say misunderstanding, language mistakes, confusion, added costs in communication, or anything negative. Not interested in that. Your opinion is going to be language is important for all the things. Agree? I mean, you can say no, but are you likely to do that? Probably not. Second page, where I would move a bit further on. Statement. Rather than being a public good, transnational corporations view electronic information as a commodity. A handful of companies dominate personal computing and try to control internet content and commerce. Very complex statement. Um, probably well meant and probably justified somewhere, but we don't know who these companies are, and whatever they're doing, it sounds very bad. I hope you agree. Uh, try to control, personal computing, dominate, okay, uh, commodity, and you're invited to agree or disagree, and then you can have your say at the bottom if you like. How do you think you're supposed to rep reply? How would you comply? Reply when put with that proposition. Move on, question five. Here are the G20 countries. I live in a country where all minority ethnic groups are well supported in terms of, I don't know what's in terms of something. Access to information, access to information, okay. We're interested in G20 countries and minority groups having access to information. And you're supposed to say yes or no, okay. Uh, the supposition here is that those big countries don't give minority groups adequate access to information. It's pretty clear, I think, and then what should we be doing to improve things? It's pretty clear, I think, that this is not really a questionnaire. Or is it? Uh, it's designed to get some data, but it's designed to get certain data. Say, 95% of the scholars, language scholars, who have replied to this questionnaire, agree that language and translation are essential for improved service and access uh, of information or giving minorities access to information. And somebody can get up in the middle of a conference on the G20 and say, this is what 95% of all the respondents say. But the questions haven't been asked in such a way that, that the opposite result could be true. And if you're a rich country at the G20 and you're interested in language policies, you could devise very quickly a questionnaire pointing out how much money is spent on translation services, access to information, language policy, how much is spent on training people like you, and, uh, and, and, and get the same people to say that things are really not so bad. Easily done. Okay? Uh, and that's not hypothetical, that's a real survey, and there are quite a few around that are used like that. My interest today is in that sort of research, 
which might be most research. Um, I'm calling it action research, but action research means a lot of different things to different people. If so, some of you are doing the research on interpreting course, and there we invite you to do one of the papers, one of the options is to do a piece of action research. And there, action research means you, you get an idea and you apply it to your own practice and you observe yourself and then you come back and see if the idea helps or it doesn't. Okay? That's action research because carrying out the research is actually action on yourself that you observe. Okay? An extension of this uh, action research is used a lot in education um, where teachers would want to test a new teaching methodology they would try it out in the class that they themselves teach. They would observe themselves, observe the students, get the students to write diaries. They themselves keep track of what happens. And that's action research, because they're involved in the research. Okay? Both those usages are fairly benign. But I think we can extend it to the sort of research we just saw, which is research as an action intended to improve things. Okay, activist research, if you like, not just action, but ac research within an activist environment. Now, what's wrong with that kind of research? Well, both. Well, just as most of us are taught when we're translating or interpreting to be neutral and objective, and just give what the speaker or the author said, so researchers are trained to be neutral and objective and just present reality as it is. Of course, reality is never simple enough to write it up as it is. This harks back to a very simple statement by uh, William LeBoff, an American social linguist, who formulated the problem in this way. The observer's paradox is, well, the aim, the aim of his social linguistics was to observe language being used as if it were not being used. To observe language as if it were not being observed. Sorry, that's better. To observe language as if it were not being observed. We want to know how people really use language, so we have to observe them. But the presence of the observer upsets the use of language, obviously part of the indeterminist principle that we meant, the uncertainty principle. Yeah. Applied to translation, the aim of research is to observe translation as if it were not being observed. Impossible to do. As soon as you observe the translator or interpreter, they're aware of that and they change their performance. Problem. How can you overcome that problem? Um, you've got two basic solutions. You can hide or you can appear. All right? uh, these days, hiding is generally not well seen. Well, by definition, but <laughs> it's not considered to be a good thing. Okay? It's considered to be dishonest because the people in certain countries have a right to uh, their personal information, uh, their image, and their speech production. Uh, people cannot, you know, one researcher used to uh, get people invite. She was doing research on how people tell stories. Fascinating subject. She would invite people to her home, give them something to eat, get them a bit drunk, and they sit down on the sofa and tell stories, and she's got a tape recorder underneath the sofa. Primitive days, primitive technology, okay? And then at the end, she brings out and says, hey, surprise, I just recorded everything. Now, if they're good friends, you get away with it, but you might lose quite a good, few good friends in the process. I mean, people don't tell stories. They're usually about someone else who's not present. Uh, and, and then want them recorded and used for research or made available in a public way. Uh, most of the solutions that are considered ethical these days choose the option up here. Manifest your presence. Tell the truth. But you say, that's going to upset objectivity, and the reply is, so what? There is no objectivity anyway. The 
principle of indeterminacy tells us that. Uh, reality is always more complex than what we make of it. We're going to intervene, so let's at least intervene ethically. How can you appear then? The basic thought here is that if we're doing research, we're working. But you need data on people, for us, translators and interpreters. And they're going to work too, to produce that data. It doesn't fall from, from the sky. So we have to give them a reason to work, and we have to have a reason to work. And basically, the only reason you're going to do this work and get someone else to help you with this is for a good cause. Your research has to help improve something somewhere. Back to the questionnaire we're at. Okay? But if you think about it, why would you do research if it weren't to improve anything? Okay, curiosity. Fair enough. Satisfying curiosity is an improvement. But having unsatisfied curiosity, you have to convince other people that this curiosity is worthwhile, is worth engaging in. More often though, you make people work for you, or you invite them to work with you, by advocating their cause. Say, right, you're interpreters, you're translators, if there are problems in your profession or in your performance, let's work on those problems, I will help you to solve those problems, that means you will help me with the research. Okay? And you're advocating a particular improvement in their professional practice. That's the first step. And that's a good sort of relationship to establish. If you haven't got that, well, you could pay them a lot of money to do the uh, experiment, but yeah, I guess that's a cause too. Right? Economic well-being is a cause. Beyond that, you can see the research as a way of empowering the people you're working with. And that means you give me the data of what you do, I'll analyze it, I'll get the results, and then I'll give those results back to you. And you can use that information, that knowledge, to do whatever you want to do in your profession. The power of knowledge isn't therefore just with the researcher, it's with the whole community involved in the research, the professional community. And that would be research accepting appearance, accepting honesty, as a mode of exchange. You give me data, I give you knowledge, you give me the capacity to produce power, knowledge is power, I'll give that back to you. I will help empower you. Beautiful idea, if only all these translators and interpreters were more open to it or would accept that knowledge can help improve practice or improve their social status even. Beyond empowerment, there is a level uh, which would be called engagement. In advocacy and advocacy, the research is outside of the professional group. Empowerment, we are outside, but helping the professional group. Engagement is where you no longer see yourself as outside. You are a member of that group who happens to be acting through research while others act by occupying Wall Street or getting their tents ripped up. Uh, fighting police in Oakland, and other more interesting activities. Um, research can be seen as one action among many uh, designed to improve things. That would be the first step, engagement. You can see here, I think, um, a decreasing proportion of pretended objectivity. Advocacy, you're the expert advocating a certain action. Empowerment, you're giving knowledge. Engagement, you are with the people helping to discover this. I take those categories from research on linguistics, particularly social linguistics. In all these variants, if you're aware of what's going on, you're engaged in action research in this sense. It is research as a self-analyzing action. You're not just producing knowledge for the hell of it, and let's make sure it's true, 
you're observing yourself producing knowledge and asking yourself what's going to happen with that knowledge. Okay? What, what kind of action are we performing and how is that action related to the other people around us, the clients and the people who can use the knowledge. Now, from that perspective, I hope you can see why it's not very ethical to say, hey, I was recording you under the sofa. Okay? This would not fit in with that mindset. It would be better to tell people before, this is what I'm trying to test. This is what we want to get to. Will you help me with this? Are you interested in seeing what we can discover? And part of it means also you don't pretend that you are outside of the research project. You have to look at yourself performing and keep data on yourself as a researcher. The research object of knowledge includes the researcher in this perspective. And indeed, uh, a lot of the way that research is written up within this frame is as a narrative, as a story. We set out to discover this, we tried this, we found this, then we moved to this, and we, at the moment we're at this point. An ongoing narrative, which will be a dialectic exchange between the person charged with uh, carrying out the research and the people giving data, but more than giving data, giving opinions and directions to the research project itself. Here are some practical examples. It's a huge number of examples to choose from. I just want to uh, give you a, a range of things that can happen. Uh, then we'll start to think about what happens in translation studies. Uh, French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu, we met him, remember, with the different capitals. Uh, he wrote a book about homeless people in France called The Misery of the World, and the book is largely interviews with homeless people, carried out by Bourdieu's research assistants, and a whole other book is just these interviews. And Bourdieu's justification of this is, look, he says, these are people who don't vote. In the democratic society, they don't exist. They're invisible. They have no voice. They're never on television, never on the radio, never in the newspapers. They never manifest themselves through the ballot box. I, as a sociologist, have a certain power within the state structure. I choose to lend some of my power to have a book and have it read to these people, and they can speak through me. And I'll do an introduction, and I'll do a conclusion at the end. But my ethical research aim here is to let excluded, voiceless people speak. Um, this is fascinating, because, fascinating uh, for me, because if you think about it, translators and interpreters, almost by definition, when you are working as translators and interpreters, do not have a voice, in the sense you don't have an I. When you say, I am tired, it usually means the author is tired and speaking through me, etc. Okay? Um, that translators and interpreters, because of this pretense to objectivity and neutrality, generally do not have a voice in our communicative acts, a voice that belongs to them. Research on translation and interpreting might be a way of simply giving them a voice, which can be read within a different genre, within a different frame. That would be one version of action research. I don't like the pretense, Bourdieu's pretense, that he's absolutely passive, you know, in selecting this or in deciding to set up the project or in uh, making the comments at the end about what should be done. But, and neither uh, is the researcher in translation studies uh, a, a passive agent just enabling translators to speak. However, the example does have something to say. Another thing that can be done is uh, to use different observers. Um, you accept that language, or translating, is going to change according to how you observe it, so you get different observers. Uh, 